All right. Well, mindful of everyone's time, we'll uh, we might make a start. So, huge thank you to everyone who's joined on uh, joined the webinar so far. Um, I still have quite a few more to jump on. So, I'm sure everyone's going to get a lot of value out of the session today. We've got some fantastic speakers, uh, both Jane and Joel, who will introduce themselves shortly. Uh, we have called this the Mother's Day Personal Finance Webinar. Uh, I guess in in honour and recognition of all of the amazing things that uh, all of the mothers around the world do. Uh, and of course, those who are not mothers, I'm sure we'll get a lot of value out of today as well. So obviously, this is a combined webinar between Global Financial Consultants, Ally Wealth Management and Greenwich Partners uh, in Perth. So plenty to cover. Uh, so mindful of everyone's time. Let's dive straight in. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we do. Uh, we do have the chat and the Q&A box both running. So any questions at all as we go through today's webinar, uh, just drop a note, we'll get to your questions uh, as we can. If they are too complicated, then uh, we might leave them to the end or anything that's too personal, uh, we will obviously uh, leave and potentially chat about offline. So let's dive right in. So naturally, being financial planners and, uh, and lawyers on this webinar today, wouldn't be a complete webinar without our disclaimer. So everything that we are going to discuss today, the topics we will go through, are uh, all for your entertainment purposes only and information. So if you need personal advice, obviously reach out to Joel or myself on the personal finance matters and reach out to Jane for any legal questions uh, or things that you would like to discuss at a personal level. So let's dive right into the content. This is a bit of an idea of what we are going to be covering today. So first and foremost, who we are, uh, why you should be listening to us, who's Jane, who's Joel, and of course, myself, Jared, here in Singapore, will tell you a bit about the companies that we are involved with, and then we'll get right into the content. Uh, so first and foremost, one of the most important topics of today, estate planning, is your family protected? What do you need to think about if you're an expat, if you're a resident, what documents should you have in place? What are some of the common mistakes that we see people making time and time again? We'll certainly be covering off that. Uh, superannuation, changes for Aussie residents, changes for expats, we're near the end of the financial year. It's budget week, fantastically exciting for those of us in the financial world, probably uh, completely boring for everybody else, um, but we're sure there's plenty that's gonna come there. We've got an election probably in the next 12 months, end of financial year in less than uh, 10 weeks. Uh, if my maths is correct there, so plenty to cover. So we'll cover off a bit on the super side. Tax changes, we've got tax cuts coming, we've got changes to tax rates, plenty to, uh, to discuss and cover there. Obviously the Aussie property market, not a day goes by where it's not in the, uh, in the headlines. So what's happening in the market? What do expats, what do residents need to know? Uh, and then of course, investment planning. Where are some of the um, I guess, areas that we're positioning clients in terms of investments at the moment. What are we watching for? Where do we see value? Uh, we'll touch on that a bit at the end as well. So on that note, Joel, I'll throw over to you to uh, tell everyone a bit about yourself, a bit about Ally Wealth. Excellent. Thank you, Jared. Um, so my name is Joel Kieran. I'm a senior financial advisor working for Ally Wealth. Ally Wealth started in 2020, so midway through a pandemic, a great time to obviously start a business and, you know, from, from scratch per se. Um, but it, it just came out from a lots of movement that happened, particularly with um, Australians living all over the world. COVID was a bit of a... Um, you know, I suppose let's call it a tumultuous time where we saw lots of movement happening, where lots of lots of people coming back to Australia, um, lots of people leaving Australia because, you know, there is they needed obviously work to continue. Um, so we, it was set up obviously to help Australian expats no matter where they live around the world. And we sort of focus on lots of broad um, financial advice and wealth planning for those for those clients living anywhere essentially so that could be from anywhere from investment advice you know cash flow modeling repatriation um, moving anywhere around the world um, and I think that as of the last list that I ran I've got clients in 32 different countries so and that is um, very much still growing and the team of Ally Wealth is still growing that is my beautiful office located in South Perth Jane and I are neighbors by about a street um, so it's it's a great area to be around. So 
yeah, that's a little bit about me and Ally Wells. Fantastic. Thank you, Joel. And uh, Jane, tell us a bit about yourself and Greenwich. Um, thanks, Jared. So um, I'm part of a small team and we, like Joel said, operate out of South Perth, which is a lovely place in the world. Um, I joined Greenwich Partners in 2009. So Alex started the practice in 1976. Um, he has more than 40 years of experience and he has a particular interest in trust, estate planning and succession planning law. Um, when I joined in 2009, I actually started as the receptionist and the legal secretary, but moved my way up and completed my law degree. Um, so now I assist Alex in all aspects of the practice um, with a particular interest, I think, in general commercial law. So um, dealing with small business transactions um, and the estate planning matters and um, more very flattered to be um, asked to this seminar to, or webinar today because I have a particular interest in assisting women um, with their particular issues, so in small business and estate planning. So, Fantastic, Jane. Well, absolutely delighted to have you with us today. I'm sure you've got Thank plenty you. of valuable content, so uh, won't, make, won't waste any more time uh, with me speaking. We'll dive right into what you've got to share with us. Uh, before we do, a little bit about global financial consultants myself. So firstly, I, I must agree, I do love South Perth as well, uh, albeit I'm sitting here in Singapore today, having lived here for uh, 11 years as of July. So it has been a while. Global financial consultants started in Sydney in 97, moved to Singapore in 2003. Uh, and again, working with Australian expats is what we do day in, day out when it comes to all things personal finance uh, outside of Australia. So I obviously work very closely with Joel um, and the team with Ally Wealth in assisting our clients all over the world. So enough about us, let's dive right into the content. So Jane, I'll throw over to yourself to perhaps start with the basics around, you know, what is estate planning? What do we need to think about? I feel like people have a bit of a loose idea, but they're not quite sure where to start and, and what it all means. Thanks, Jared. <clears throat> yes, I agree. I think it's a term that we throw around all the time without actually appreciating um, what it means and it does um, seem to be that it's overwhelming for a lot of people as well so um, basically at the most simplest estate planning is the arrangement of your assets and this is from the point of view of while you're alive to maximize your wealth and um, also as well to assist your family on your death um, and ensure that you protect your assets um, so a good estate plan is generally a, um, a joint effort between you, your family, and obviously um, a multiple of professionals, so financial planners, solicitors, accountants, those sorts of people, um, and everybody sort of puts in and you get a, an estate plan out of that. Um, as you said, Jared, I'm going to be more looking at the, um, the will side of it and what documents you should put in place to ensure um, your assets are protected. Um, and I believe you and um, Joel will talk more about the financial aspects, particularly, um, you know, wealth creation and wealth protection during your lifetime. Um, on that note, I just wanted to also make the note that estate planning is not something just for the extremely wealthy. Um, everybody should have an estate plan if you've got a family. Um, by having an estate plan, like I said, you can protect your assets or organise your assets during your life, but you can also make um, your family's life a lot easier on your death and also ensure that they're protected and that your wealth goes to the people that you care about the most. Um, so um, on that note, I will um, start with a will. And again, I um, know it's very basic, but I do know that a lot of people mention these off the cuff without fully understanding what it is. But basically, um, a valid will is a legal document where you choose um, a person who you want to organ or help distribute your assets on your death, as well as determine who you want those assets to be distributed to and how. Um, only recently, actually, in the news, there was a report saying that about 60% of all Australians don't actually have a will. Um, and they did emphasise the importance of, of, of having a will. And I agree. I think it is extremely important. Um, however, I think um, in terms of the complexity, there is some complexity. And even though you think you may have a will, it does need to be a valid will for it to be effective on your death. Um, a valid will uh, must be completed and signed correctly. I won't get bogged down in the legislation, but the Wills Act provides a number of things that determine um, whether or not your will is valid. And that's why it's really important to ensure that you get some advice in that regard. Um, 
and on that and also to be valid it mustn't be revoked by you and there's actually situations where you can unintentionally revoke your will things like marriage um, if you write a letter that can amount to testamentary wishes on your death those sorts of things but I will touch on that um, a bit more later um, if you so if you don't have a will what happens if you don't have a will the court will actually um, make provision of your or distribute your assets. So under the Administration Act, um, the um, legislation gives the Supreme Court the ability to have some discretion as to how your assets will be distributed. Um, and there's a certain um, a schedule of rules that they have to follow in doing this. Um, those that are most relevant, I thought, for us today, um, so a particular situation, family situation. So, for instance, if you're unmarried and have no children, um, the court will give the whole of your estate to your um, closest relatives, so your siblings and your parents. If, you, if you're married and have no children, then your spouse will have your estate. However, if your estate is quite large, your spouse might get some and your parents might also um, get a portion of your estate. If you're married with children, um, your spouse will get the whole of your estate. However, again, if your estate's quite large and we're talking, you know, um, in excess of um, $400,000, then um, it'll be divided between your spouse and your children. Um, most importantly, and probably what um, is most relevant to myself as well, I'm not married in any de facto relationship. Um, under the legislation, de facto relationships are particularly complex and they're not as um, covered as they are um, if you were married. Um, so if you're married with children, for instance, um, you can quite comfortably know that if you died without a will, your estate would go to your um, husband or wife, as the case may be, um, and your children. However, when you're in a de facto relationship, um, it's only more recently that the law has been changed um, out of interest, by the way. Um, and now um, your de facto spouse is treated like um, a legally married spouse. However, you have to have been living with your spouse for at least two years. Um, and if there is any um, debate about whether a relationship exists, the court will have discretion as to whether or not they find there has been a relationship. Um, things they take into account are whether you lived with the person, the nature of your relationship, whether you had assets together. Um, and on top of that, if you're in a relationship and your partner has been married previously, that previous partner may also have an entitlement to the estate. So um, it is very important to have a will in place um, in any situation, but I think particularly in the case where you're not married and you do um, have a de facto spouse or even just living in a domestic relationship. More importantly, even if you um, don't live with them and you're in a relationship and you would like them to benefit from your estate. So um, something to keep in mind, I think. Um, so when you've got to that point and you go, okay, I really need to put a will in place, um, the things you probably need to consider um, before you even look at getting advice are things like um, your assets, so what you own, um, any debt, so I'm talking like mortgages, car loans, those big sort of debts, or if you have a um, big credit card, um, who you want to appoint to deal with your estate after your death. So this is an important decision that you've got to make and um, a decision you should talk to that person about. Um, in the case of spouses, that's usually each other, but of course you can appoint anyone you choose as long as they're over 18. And sometimes I know um, my clients feel they would like to appoint their financial advisor, accountant or solicitor just to take that pressure off their own family and, of course, get some financial advice. Um, and then you want to um, make sure that you um, make adequate provision for all your beneficiaries. So in the case of being married and having children, you want to make sure that you leave enough of your estate for each of your beneficiaries, so each of your wife and your or husband and children. Um, I raise this because there is the risk that your will can be challenged. And what this means for you is that even if you have a will in place, if someone believes they haven't been catered for under your will in an adequate way, they can challenge that. And if successful, that gives the court the power to override the terms of your will. Um, however, um, 
the only time that the court will do this is where you have clearly not made um, provision for someone and they base this decision on um, a overview of the whole of your estate, um, the lack of provision for that person, but also how that will impact your other beneficiaries. So um, I think trying to um, establish a good um, distribution of assets is important as well. Um, and then next, um, you also need to consider the fact that a lot, some of your assets won't actually be part of your estate and you cannot determine um, where they go to on your death by your will. Um, this will include jointly held property, so any real estate, um, bank accounts or anything in joint names, so um, a lot of spouses will do this. That doesn't form part of your estate, but will automatically go to the other joint holder of that property automatically on your death. Um, property held in trust is not yours to give away. Um, some shares are unable to be um, gifted under your will. Um, and most importantly, I think for us here today, superannuation is the big one. And I see this all the time. People come to us um, and want to leave their super in a particular way. Um, unfortunately, super, superannuation benefits don't automatically form part of your estate. Um, ultimately, it depends on your superannuation arrangements. And you will need to talk to obviously your the trustee of your super fund as to those arrangements and get financial advice sometimes. Um, but generally speaking, um, what happens is when um, a will gets put in place, you want to look at putting a binding death benefit nomination um, at the same time under super law. Um, it allows you to make a um, nomination to the trustee of the fund to nominate where your benefits go on your death. Um, most often I would recommend that um, a binding death benefit nomination be put in place whereby you appoint a legal person or representative. So this means that your super benefits will go to your estate on your death. Um, this is an easier way of doing it. It's great for your um, family. And it also, in the case of some people um, where you have a lot of um, assets, say, in property, it gives some cash to be able to pay for expenses and just deal with your estate and do those necessary things. Um, so most public funds permit binding death benefit nominations. However, um, there are some um, requirements you have to meet. So, of course, you should seek further advice in that regard. Um, and they usually last about three years. So as part of any estate plan, you should definitely consider ensuring that your super is going to go where you intend it to go on your death, whether that be part of your estate or not. Um, I, that's just my personal advice in terms of super in the sense that it does make things a lot easier when it forms part of your estate. Um, <clears throat> on that note as well, um, any life insurance policies, um, whether or not they form part of your estate, again, will depend on whether they're part of your super and whether who owns the policy or um, and who um, should receive that policy. So these are all considerations. Again, you need to make sure that everything's in order as part of your bigger estate plan to ensure that um, you've got any nomination in place, that it goes to where you want it to go. Um, and again, my advice would be that it would go to your estate or to your legal person or representative. Again, I can't tell you how important it is to allow um, your executor to have some um, form of cash. Um, as part of my job, I often... Um, and draft the will, but also um, act for the family right up until the point where the estate of a person who's deceased is administered. And it becomes very difficult when there's just not enough um, actual care to be able to attend to the matters that need to be attended to. So um, things like super and life insurance policies can be, um, can be a great way to deal with that aspect. Um, I also wanted to briefly touch on um, overseas assets in your wills, just because this is particularly relevant to both Jared and um, Joel's clients, I understand. So um, a lot of you probably um, have assets in Australia, but maybe also in another country or countries as the case may be. Um, in such situations, um, <laughs> it depends again on your personal circumstances, but basically if you um, have a will in a, another country that's a signatory to um, the convention providing a uniform law in the form of an international will. It will also apply in Australia, 
And as long as the will meets the requirements of its form, you um, you can be sure that your assets are protected under that particular will. Um, there's about 13 countries that are signatories to the convention, including Australia, the UK and the US. Um, if you have assets outside of these countries, it may be necessary that you need to put in place another will or wills. Um, of course, I can't advise you on this. I'm not an expert in international law by any means. Um, so the idea would be that you would seek legal advice in the country in which those assets um, are held and um, have a will in Australia and um, a will in each country in which an asset is held. The only thing that I um, do want to raise is it's really important to make sure that you liaise um, between solicitors and ensure that one will does not revoke the other unintentionally because um, that could create a very messy situation later on um, for your family. Um, and so usually that just means that in there you would just state that this will does not revoke um, any other previous wills made by you um, in any other country. It's as simple as that, but it's very important um, and finally, I just wanted to touch on um, reviewing your will, because once you've gone to all this trouble of making an estate plan and putting in the first step of your estate plan being your will, um, a lot of people think, oh, that's it, I'm done, um, good for me, pat on the back. Um, unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. Um, like I said earlier, um, your will can be revoked um, under certain circumstances. And whenever something major in your life happens, it's actually a um, good flag for you to review your estate plan generally, um, but particularly your will. Um, so I generally recommend every two to three years that you just have a look and make sure that nothing um, in your will um, is not what you wish it to be anymore. But basically the, the life events that really need to flag this for you is if you change your name, so if you get married, um, if your executor dies, so your executor is the person who you appoint as your um, person who controls your assets after your death and distributes those assets, or they could even come to you and say they don't want to do it anymore. That's a great time to review your will. Um, if one of the people you leave um, something to under your will dies or their circumstances change, it might be um, a time for you to review your will. If you've gifted a particular property, um, this is most relevant if you have a house, for instance, and you decide to sell that house, you need to make sure that um, your will is reviewed in that sense and um, it's covered. Um, and, of course, if you marry or divorce, both, of, um, both marriage and divorce can revoke your will, which means it's no longer valid. So um, as soon as you're formally divorced or married, you've no longer got a will in place, so you need to, need to make sure that you have one. Um, also, even if you end or start a de facto relationship, it's a good prompt as well to make sure that you review your will and everything's in order. Um, and finally, if you have children, of course, or even if you um, adopt or foster children or you get into a relationship with the person who has children, so you have stepchildren, all these are very important. Um, I note that the definition of children for the purpose of estate planning law doesn't actually include stepchildren, fostered or adopted children. So if this is um, something particular to you, that's definitely um, where your will would have to be reviewed to include those children if you wish. Um, and as part of that estate planning documentation, it's also really important to look at enduring powers of attorney, enduring powers of the guardianship, <coughs> excuse me, um, your will looks after your assets on your death and is great um, assistance to your family in a really stressful time. However, um, prior to your death, there's instances where you might have an accident and become or suffer illness and become incapacitated and unable to make decisions for yourself. Um, this is where um, enduring powers of attorney and enduring powers of guardianship are particularly helpful um, for you and for your family. Um, because um, it, the both documents, so ensure EPAs and EPGs can um, it, they can assist you to appoint the people that you want to act, but also assist your family members in really stressful um, periods of time. So um, an injury power of attorney is simply a document that allows you to appoint another person um, 
to make financial and or property decisions on your behalf. So once you appoint an attorney, that person can do anything you can do um, and would only happen if you um, weren't able to make those decisions for yourself. On the other hand, an enduring power of guardianship, um, that's a document where you can appoint another person to make personal lifestyle and treatment decisions. Um, treatment decisions in this context means medical, surgical or dental um, and is particularly relevant, I think, um, when it comes to palliative care or life-sustaining um, decisions that need to be made. Um, and I think by putting in place quite simple documents, actually, that um, it can really assist those people in those, um, those family members when something like this does happen. Um, the last thing I wanted to, oh, and I should say also that if you don't put these in place, obviously there's still the ability for your family to act, but it's much more complex process for them. Um, the state administrative tribunal gets involved, which is a legal application. So um, obviously that's why I recommend these documents too as part of your estate plan, because obviously you want to um, protect your family when you're well, unwell and on your death. Um, and finally, I just wanted to mention advanced health directives too. Um, advanced health directives are a document where you can put in place where you can um, set out a lot of your decisions about um, the treatment you actually want from a medical perspective. It used to be the case that solicitors would help you do this, but um, the laws changed quite recently and is now um, a pro rata form that you can actually get from the government website, Department of Health, I believe. And, um, and set out all of these decisions like um, treatment decisions, life-sustaining decisions, and you can actually upload them to the um, your MyGov portal now so that um, your whole family, your doctors, your medical team will know these decisions. Um, and I think um, that's, I mean, this is a very, very complex topic and I've tried to narrow it down as much as possible, but I suppose if there's anything you can take away from today, um, estate planning is very, very important um, and it's an ongoing process. Um, the start of that process, I think, is obtaining um, financial advice and considering putting in place this documentation. So your will, your enduring power of attorney, your enduring power of guardianship and possibly your advanced health directive. Um, and I think um, as well, just opening this conversation between family members as well is important so all your family members are aware of the situation. So um, I open up the floor to Jaron and Joel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Look, um, gosh, yes, yeah, certainly a lot more to unpack in the realm of estate planning than just you know, drafting your will. Um, and I think you really highlighted the importance of making sure you're reviewing this on an ongoing basis, not just setting up a will that you've forgotten where you put it because you put it somewhere safe and you're not quite sure where that safe place is or you've moved house now or you, know, you haven't told your executor, just, yeah, so important to be reviewing these things on an ongoing basis. Um, now, one question uh, that's come through, and I'll, I'll throw this one over to you now. Uh, so you mentioned having wills in, in yeah. different countries. So uh, yeah. you know, it might be a client of Joel's, a client of mine, maybe they're living yeah. in Singapore or Hong Kong, wherever. I'll paraphrase this one a little bit to make it a bit more broad. Uh, now, assets in Australia, assets in Singapore, maybe assets yeah. in, in the UK as well. Yeah. Now, if we're going to go down the path of having a will in each country, should those wills be the same in that should they basically mirror each other or is it better to say, all right, my Singapore will does the Singapore assets, my UK will does the UK assets and my Australian will does the Australian assets? Do you have a view on on which is best or is that a, a, a case by case? So I think um, generally speaking, your lawyers in each country should liaise with each other. They would um, to a certain extent mirror each other, but they would generally deal with the separate assets in each country. And the reason for this is obviously because there's um, a myriad of laws that differ, for instance, tax implications. In Australia, we don't have death duties, but there's many countries, including the UK, which do. Um, so from a broader estate planning, you would want to get advice um, on how to leave those assets in your will in another country. 
um, but also have your solicitors liaise with each other. So obviously it's part of your broader estate plan again, so it can work together. Um, and then obviously um, all of those moving parts in terms of tax and death duties and um, the way you leave your assets can work together and achieve what you want to achieve overall. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and one other that's uh, just come through, and I must admit a fairly common one, so I like this question. Uh, a lot of clients who are, or just expats in general, might be Australians living all over the world. Yeah. And they know that they are beneficiaries of their, let's say, parents' estate. Yeah. Should they be seeking advice as well around how those assets are going to be treated, taxed, what to do with them? Do they Definitely. have their own implications based on where they're living? Yeah, definitely. So um, I obviously, like I said, I can't um, give you any advice in terms of overseas law, but, you know, if you're receiving a lump sum of money or um, real estate, even from somewhere else into Australia, you should definitely seek by advice in that regard. And if your family's open in that um, in that aspect and you know that you're going to get something and your parents are quite elderly, it's a good idea to mention that um, when you see a solicitor as part of your estate plan because that should be taken into account. Those assets that you're going to get, you would have to deal with as well. So a great estate plan would also account for assets that you may accumulate in the future, whether that be from your own or from your family. Mm, absolutely. No, that's fantastic. Hopefully that um, that answers that one. Uh well, look, mindful of time, and uh, gosh, I feel like we could probably spend the whole hour uh, just talking about estate planning, but um, I believe Joel has a few things to share with us too. So we might uh, might push on. Uh, Joel, I'll throw over to you to talk us through some of the changes uh, around superannuation, obviously quite relevant to the estate planning topics that Jane's already run through with us, uh, but obviously quite a few changes on the cards as well in the not-too-distant future. Absolutely, and it's, you know, it's always nice to have this sort of wealth that accumulates that we can that you could potentially leave to someone but in in you know i i tend to speak broadly to all of my clients that it's much easier to die broke than it is to um then to leave a lot of money so we should all be out there enjoying our life but you know i suppose it's it's knowing it's knowing exactly um the day that we're going to die you know we can model exactly to that day what to spend right but Unfortunately, the unknown is a little bit there. Um, so, yeah, coming up, I believe tomorrow is budget day. So there's going to be um, some a raft of changes coming in the Australian side, particularly with the budget. Um, there's going to be some tax cuts. So it's, you know, we, every Australian, I feel, will appreciate uh, the benefit of lower taxes, considering we live in a very high tax jurisdiction. Um, but from a superannuation perspective, from the 1st of July um, 2024, there's some changes coming. Um, the concessional contribution cap and the non-concessional contribution cap, they're both increasing. So the concessional contribution cap are contributions that we make to superannuation where we don't, where we can claim a tax deduction. Um, non-concessional is where we don't claim any tax benefit from that contribution. It's just a nice, healthy way for us to, to beef out our superannuation accounts. Um, the concessional contributions also include our employer contributions. So, um, which I will touch on um, a little bit later. The superannuation guarantee contribution rates are also increasing from July. So that's going up to 11.5%. So we're getting a nice little extra um, small percentage from our employer contributions. The downsizer contribution age was reduced. So that is now age 55. Previously, that was 60. This is a great opportunity for, um, you know, parents if you're living in a broader house or for or even for example you've um, sold a house that was once your primary residence that you've owned for 10 years and you're over the age of 55 this is a really good way to move three hundred thousand dollars each essentially into your superannuation environment which is you know far much more tax effective than it is by having it in your own names the transfer balance cap um to 1.9 million, that's what it currently is at the moment. There's no additional news for that being increased, unfortunately, from the 1st of July, but that is also welcomed. I do anticipate that that will continue to rise up to circa 2.3, 2.4 million, probably within the ne over the next decade. Um, and then there's also carry concessional carry forward contributions. So that is, 
you can use unused concessional contributions um, from prior years in one year. Again, there's some really good um, tax advantages to doing so, particularly if you have um, trigger some CGT assets or you've got some taxable event that that happens. These are good. Um, these are good times for, uh, you know, a good use of that money, more or less. So with superannuation broadly, the, you know, that you with these caps, essentially from this slide, you know, the first the first little window there, we can't control that set by the ATO. The the next two right windows, the investments and the withdrawals, that's what we can control inside superannuation. So we can obviously invest our superannuation essentially any way we like. Now, if you're with sort of any of the major retail or industry super funds, you know that your investment options might be relatively limited. So that could be, you know, the, the high growth, the balanced, conservative style um, fund approach. Um, you know, that, that might be the extent of your investment selection, but, or you can go into, you know, for example, the self-managed super fund route and it just becomes essentially endless. You're, you know, everything from gold bars to fine art. Um, so it, it, as long as it's for the purpose of re providing retirement benefits for the members. Insurance inside super, again, we can control that. And as Jane touched on earlier, who we nominate in our, as the beneficiaries of our superannuation fund, um, really important to have those in place, whether that's, you know, paid to your estate, paid to your spouse, whoever that is. Um, you know, it's really important to make sure that we're checking our binding nominations. And then obviously when we get to retirement, um, hopefully we've accumulated the nice nest egg we transition that from an accumulation account to a pension account. A pension account for the benefit is completely tax exempt. So there's tax-free earnings, tax-free dividends, there's no capital gains tax. Um, and any pension payments that are paid from your super fund to you are also tax exempt. So there's a there's a great incentive there to have a nice healthy nest egg, um, particularly inside um, superannuation and pension accounts, particularly later on in life. That little scenario that you can see there at the bottom, um, we've got obviously an account-based pension versus an investment property. Let's just assume they're both worth um, 1.9 million. The rent on your $1.9 million property, 95,000 versus a pension payment, 95,000. We can see there that the net outcome is actually very different after considering tax. And when I suppose we like to talk about this broadly in the in the light of women per se, there's also additional contributions that can be quite beneficial. Um, knowing that women take, can ordinarily take time out of the workforce, um, that could be to raise children, um, to have other family matters taken care of. You know, we do have other contributions such as spouse contributions, where, for example, your spouse can add contributions to your superannuation fund and claim tax benefits for doing so. So it's re there is obviously income thresholds and contribution caps and limits um, that go with this, but it's really important to consider that, um, you know, even whilst you're not working, uh, you know, it's, you know, your superannuation should not be left behind. It's also, it's an asset that you're going to be obviously very, welcome to have a nice healthy accumulated balance come retirement. Um, in other news, I saw randomly, you know, just off topic, the Queensland government has come out and said um, employees of the Queensland government, uh, whilst they're on unpaid maternity leave, they will, con they will continue to receive super contributions. Um, so that's a really, uh, it's a, a really proactive approach, particularly for any public servants in the Queensland government. They're looking to, they're looking to make that into law, which is, you know, it's really, I, I believe it's a really good incentive to make sure that, you know, women's super particu particularly is not left behind. Um, in times where, for example, they are on unpaid work um, breaks, you know, for example, raising children. I also do have clients in that, in on the flip side of that, where the female earns more than the man and the man stays at home. So the same works in reverse. So it's, um, it's also, those caps are not obviously, you know, based on gender at, by any means. So they are available to either side of that, either side of that coin. There's also, for example, here where we're looking at boosting our superannuation, you know, if you've 
for women who have re-entered the workforce or may have not contributed to superannuation, salary sacrificing is a really great way of um, reaccumulating or really growing on that balance. This just highlights their um, sort of the net outcome of you know, salary sacrifice and um, your net tax or your net pay more or less from um, contributing to super. This is likely to change given that we are having some tax changes coming on the 1st of July. So there's essentially a benefit if you're earning in excess of $100,000. Um, your tax benefit for this financial year up until um, the 1st or 30th of June 2024 is likely going to be greater than that um, if you're if you do this from the 1st of July 2024. So if there's just re a really good incentive here to consider right well what is your what is your ideal retirement objective what is our income objective when we um, when we do retire and how best do we maximize our retirement benefit and super and salary sacrifice is a really great way to do so um, so this is just sort of looking more or less for my non-resident clients and anyone who's not currently living in Australia here if you have um, Australian taxable property, um, so that is anything that will always remain taxable in Australia, this could be, for example, positively geared rental properties. So you have a rental property here in Australia, you're living abroad, um, and your that rental income is in positive to the expenses. In this case, for example, non-resident tax rates start at 32.5%. So you would be taxed on any positively geared rental income at 32.5%. Using superannuation contributions can be a really great way to negate some of that tax. So in this example here, you can see the concessional contribution cap is $27,500. Um, if, if that was the positively geared um, or positive rental income that you'd received. If you made a contribution to superannuation for $27,500, um, that, that would reduce your personal tax taxable income to the ATO down to zero. Um, you would pay contribution tax of 15% inside the fund, but that's 17.5% better than you'd pay to the ATO. So it's it's obviously not, not an absolute ideal getting you out of all tax, but it's it's at least a four thousand eight hundred dollar saving that you're saving on paying to the ATO. Certainly an important one. I mean, we find uh, I, I'd have to say a number of expats look at this and think, oh, a few thousand dollars or fifteen percent. But I must say, it's uh, much more appealing than a kick in the teeth. So don't ignore this one. End of financial year is rapidly approaching, and even you know, even if your taxable income is five grand, you know, still more than a thousand dollars back in your pocket. I'm sure you can find a much more enjoyable way to spend it than uh, allowing the ATO to do so. So definitely pay attention to this one and seek some advice. That's it. And as well, it's worth also considering, you know, everyone's at a different stage of their working life, particularly like, you know, a conversation that I was having this morning with some clients, they're in their mid fifties at the moment. And, you know, we're starting to talk about, you know, yes, they are living abroad. And their argument was, oh, but if I have investments abroad, they're more tax effective than super because they're tax free. They were very lucky to be living in a tax free jurisdiction. And, you know, my argument is, well, is it going to be tax-free when you move back to Australia in four years? Unlikely not, because the ATO is going to start taxing you. So the it's really important to consider where you are in that stage of life and what assets you're going to be using in even the short, medium and long term to generate a long-term tax-effective retirement income. And superannuation in Australia is always going to be a a, a goal kicker particularly in that in that space. So whilst there might be some short term some short term tax to pay, particularly if we're paying 15% on accumulation, it's it's going to obviously pay dividends when you know we're 70 retired and drawing tax free income. The carry forward um, concessional contributions, again, this is a really great strategy for us to put large, a, a larger amount of capital into superannuation and claim tax relief on that contribution. To meet the rules, 
you have to have a superannuation balance less than 500,000 and your concessional contributions in any year exceed your concessional contribution cap. So I'll just break that down. So the five years preceding up to the current year, so this is going back to what, 2018, 2019 or 2019, 2020, the any unused concessional contributions from those years can be used in the current financial year. So the current financial cap is 27,500. Let's just say hypothetically you sell an asset in Australia and you've realized a $100,000 capital gain. That 100 that with it that $100,000 capital gain you have also contributed nothing to super for the last 5 years for example. Now you could effectively reduce your personal income tax liability down or by that capital gain, you could essentially add up to a hundred thousand dollars in this in that in that case and then claim a tax deduction for that. And it's a really healthy way to move um, a bulk of money inside the superannuation environment for the future of long-term planning. Really important to seek some advice on this. There's some really great um there's some really great uh, tools that you can also use on the ATO portal in MyGov under the superannuation menu. The ATO, obviously, with things like single touch payroll, they can sort of keep track of what your superannuation contributions have been. Um, so it's really, you can even look in there and see what your carry forward concessional amounts are, what your eligibility to contribute is. Um, but broadly speaking, important to get some advice to make sure that what you can contribute and we're not triggering any sort of excess penalty charges or taxes there. <clears throat> the next I really want to touch on, and I know that Jane spoke about this a little bit broadly again, insurance inside super. Look, I, I have previously been a life insurance advisor um, solely in a, in a prior financial advice life. Um, so I have seen hundreds of different life insurance contracts over my time. And look, there is good, there's bad and they're ugly and they're not all treated the same. So it's really important to consider that if you do just have default insurance cover, that's inside your superannuation fund, that it is actually fit for its purpose. It's great to think that, you know, the last one, you know, for example, there was one of them that I had um, where, you know, legal super. So, you know, for those working in the law profession, right, a lawyer working overseas, it says in their PDS, you will not be covered if you are not an Australian resident. So they've got this life insurance policy in place with legal super that they're paying for but they're currently living not in Australia. So therefore, in the event of their death, their, their life insurance is actually not valid and they won't be paid. So it's really important not just to look at the, the policies that you've got and the premiums that you're paying, but again, the underlying um, terms and conditions of your policy, because we the only time an insurance policy serves any purpose to us is when we need to make a claim on it. And when we do need to make a claim on it, we want to hope to God that they're going to pay out. And we don't want to have um, the like them for have the ability to say we're not actually going to honour that claim because of X condition in the PDS. So again, really important to seek some advice here. Um, trawling through some PDSs is some of my fabulous late night reading. Um, luckily, we have software and systems that compare um, a lot of this in detail so we can make relatively light work of it. So again, really important to get some to get advice here and make sure that one, your insurance is um, enough to, to and is fit for purpose for you. And two, it's actually going to be relevant when you're actually going to need it. And probably just uh, just one more point there, I guess, Joel, if I may, you know, we, we see this time and time again with expats where they're trying to, I guess, sort of solve one problem and end up creating three more over here where, uh, and we've had this conversation more times than I care for, where we've got clients who say, well, my cover's not valid for expats, so I'll just tell them I live in Australia. That'll be fine. So I'll just keep my Australian address and I'll just lie to my super fund and all will be well. We'll sadly ensure them not that stupid and they will investigate where you were residing and where you were paying tax and naturally all of this will come up or it could also create obviously tax residency problems for you down the track so 
I think your point of seeking advice and making sure that it's all actually looked at together and makes sense and working um, is just so critically important. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that was highlighted um, in the in uh, by the current Labor government is a $3 million cap per se on our superannuation. They're looking to obviously impose, um, you know, the tax benefits uh, that sort of cap out at $3 million. So superannuation is currently taxed at 15%. In the event, what they're looking to imply is, you know, if your balance exceeds $3 million, that 15% tax will jump to 30%. So any any earnings that happen on balances in excess of 3 million will attract a um, an additional 15% tax. There is obviously rationale behind this on both sides of the fence, no matter what side you sit politically. Um, but either way, what has not been included in that in that law is the is the indexation or um, inflation of that cap, $3 million cap. So I, I would like to hope that common sense will prevail here and they will index up the cap eventually. Um, but it's really important that when we're only working with what we know as, as that currently, it's really important that we try and again not forget about our superannuation because if we have to impose if we have to abide by a three million dollar cap then the value of that three million dollars is going to erode over time as you can see i'm i'm sort of if i'm 35 now um you know the value of three million dollars at today's value is essentially only nine hundred and twenty four thousand. so again we really need to pay attention to the to our superannuation and making sure that it's not being left behind I always get this question as a financial advisor. I swear it's daily at the moment. Um, it's how much money do I need to have for how much income that I want? And this is just starting to highlight we've got what's called the four percent rule. So if all of our if all of our investments earned earned an income of four percent, this is the kind of income objectives that we are that we are looking that sort of you're looking at. So to earn a hundred thousand dollars in um, retirement income of 4%, you would need about $2.5 million in today's figures. Now, obviously, as CPI and inflation erodes um, the value of our cash, that obviously will start to deplete that $2.5 million because $100,000 this year is potentially, you know, $105,000 next year. It's it's $110,000 in five years' time. So you can see this, it's it's, you're not going to be living off the same $100,000 for the rest of your life. Um, it's really important to note as well, and I've seen this, you know, at the moment on the news, particularly in Australia, it's, you know, how much money should you have in your super fund? Broadly speaking, I, I tend to disagree with a lot of this um, just because ev no, everyone is in a different set of circumstances. Everyone is different. Everyone has a different income. Everyone has a different expense level. We're all in different financial situations. And so, you know, when you're seeing, you know, oh, I sh by the time you're 40, you should have $200,000 in Zupa, it's, it's rot. You need to really consider about what's right for you and what style of income and retirement objective you want to have not what you know the news tells you that you should have or what the the super funds tell you is a comfortable retirement it's everything that as i said we can control we should control and they are things like contributions and future um, investments to to control our outcome for the benefit of long term so yeah that's that's my, I suppose, one only, one only, you know, little stab at when there's when there's generalisation here. Um, tax, oh, love, love tax. It's probably one of my favourite topics, of course. Um, Australia, we pay way too much of it in comparison to lots of my other clients and Jared smirking there while he's sitting in Singapore. Um, but proposed from the first of July, twenty twenty four, we are having some tax bracket um, changes, which is which is always welcomed, of course. So we're seeing um, the tax-free threshold remain the same. The The first tax bracket's dropping a couple of percent there um, from, 19, um, from 19 to 16. That second bracket dropping from 32.5 to 30. 
30, 37 is remaining the same, but however, that $135 um, window has indexed up from the, from the 90, oh uh, God, 120? God, yeah, 120. So I'm, that's obviously testing my exact maths. And then the upper threshold is increasing from 180 to 190. This is all excluding the 2% Medicare levy as well. So um, it's obviously great. It probably means if you're on one of those higher income tax brackets above 190,000, your tax benefit is going to be about four, just over four grand so per annum. So a little bit more money into the pocket. And as well for the non-residents, we're seeing a tax reduction there from 32.5% to 30%, which is, again, welcomed for our non-resident clients. So this is where we then talk about, right, well, how do we structure our investments, particularly when we're looking at how we, how we want to you know, accumulate our wealth? How can we do this tax effectively? Um, how can we do this from an estate planning perspective? What's what's a lot of the benefits here? The first one um, that I've put there is um, insurance bonds. So these are investments that we can put, you know, they're essentially a life insurance contract and they're treated by the Life Insurance Act. And the investments within the, um, that are held with inside an insurance bonds are treated a little bit differently to how they are if they're owned in your own personal name. So the investments can largely be the same. They do attract a different tax position. Again, probably broadly speaking, it's something that we um, can, that you should get advice on because this can be a little bit more tax effective, particularly in Australia, if you're a high income earner. Discretionary family trusts. Family trusts are, again, a great, a great um, tool, a great vehicle to use um, to protect assets, you know, particularly in an estate planning perspective as well. Jane, um, I suppose just sort of throwing over to you any sort of key points, you're the lawyer um, on the call. So um, benefits of a family trust in, I'd say, give us 100 words on what you see, where they come into a lot of the benefits here. Um, yes, yeah, so, excuse me, um, as I said before, you can't, um, <clears throat> they're not your assets anymore to leave undue will, but obviously they do. They have asset protection advantages, tax advantages, um, and you can also um, use it as a ve an investment vehicle as well. So um, it's a great way to do it. I mean, it's the same, although I'm saying that it's the same as a self-managed super fund, there are some expenses in terms of maintaining it and updating it and getting it established and the ongoing costs. But I mean, if you've got significant assets that you wanna maintain for your retirement and your children, um, it's a great vehicle in which to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And we have seen where that has come into play, you know, quite, quite broadly speaking about, you know, distributing of income, particularly when it's an investment trust um, and, you know, asset protection, you know, that the, the trust owns that assets and it can um, only pass to, I suppose, the beneficiaries of those trusts. Yeah. The the next one, obviously, company ownership. Again, there's, there's control rules, there's different tax treatments. Um, it would just depend on, again, your personal situation, what the, what the benefits are, um, what the cons are. They're, that's going to be very broad, um, you know, just depending on your personal situation. Individual um, or joint direct ownership. Um, again, these will form part of your estate. Anything that's um, individually owned will likely form part of your estate. Joint assets can only be passed to um, the joint asset holder. There's uh, probably also worth mentioning as well, you've got two types of joint ownership. You've got joint ownership or tenants in common, um, where you've got tenants in common, uh, or you've, let's just say you've got purchased a property that is tenants in common, that um, ownership that you hold it does actually form part of your estate. It doesn't automatically revert. So it's really important to understand how your um, investments are structured and how your property is structured. And superannuation, again, superannuation ordinarily does not form part of your estate, and so it's dealt with by a binding nomination. Um, but all of these are different ways in which we can own investment assets. They all serve a different purpose. They all achieve a different tax outcome. They all have, you know, very varying outcomes. And so it's really important that you seek advice on what's going to be appropriate um, for you here. 
We might so this uh, is... skip over the example, Joel. I uh, just mind yeah. everyone's time today, but yeah. uh, we'll uh, jump through to um, maybe just on the sort of super. Actually, yeah, might even just uh, jump forward to the yeah. bit of super strategy as an example, if you like. Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is just sort of talking about investments inside superannuation and where we can use um, some investments um, to essentially to our advantage, um, particularly within, with the different types of investment structures. So superannuation, again, has a maximum tax rate of 15%. Now, Australia has a process or called franking credits or imputation, um, which is designed to prevent double taxation. Um, the so at at present, for example, in this example, you know we've got CBA shares worth um, thirteen thousand six hundred and forty dollars. Um, let's just assume the dividend yield on CBA shares is five point five percent, and that's essentially what it has been. Um, where we can then manipulate franking credits, particularly inside super, is to derive an enhanced tax outcome. So with this tax outcome, you can see here when the franking credit is refunded or rebatable back because the 30% tax or like the 30% tax credit is only gobbled up about by half, you get a refund of the difference, particularly inside superannuation, which is effectively a really tax effective way to increase your yield um, after tax in your superannuation fund, or in this example, from 4.67 to 6.68. This becomes particularly attractive, again, in retirement phase pension accounts, you know, where they've gone completely tax exempt, you know, you're getting a rebatable franking credit in its entirety. So you've essentially boosted your yield um, even further. Again, really useful strategies that we can use you know, providing providing any government is not going to play around with franking credits or imputation, who knows? Um, so this is, but again, this is some sort of broad strategy that um, that we tend to see work quite helpful for a lot of retirees. And probably worth uh, worth just noting, and again, we you know we see this all the time with expats. Are oh, I don't want to contribute to super because it's fifteen percent tax, but I can invest my money outside and pay nothing. But the reality is when you start considering these little sort of intricacies and various strategies around franking credits and tax rebates, you're not actually necessarily paying 15% tax mm. because you're getting all these credits back. They all get realised in the financial year. We're seeing them all flow through. So, you know, your tax rate might not be 15. It might actually be more like three or five or, or eight mm. uh, or something much closer to the zero. So that's obviously not a recommendation to go and throw all your money into your super fund. It is a recommendation to go and seek proper advice uh, and, of course, speak to Jane to make sure uh, uh, your estate planning wishes are all carried out correctly, um, but certainly not one to be ignored just because of that headline tax rate. Yeah. Um, and so property, I swear it's Australia's um, love story. We we love talking about property it's there is so many considerations um, for you know 2024. We've seen housing housing crises. We've it's it's property is all on the news, and it probably will be um, for forever, just because of you know our love hate relationship with it. You either you either have it or you don't, and you know sometimes you have it and hate it. Sometimes you don't have it and hate it. Either way. But, you know, there's lots to consider here when particularly when we're dealing with property and, you know, estate planning of that property assets are, you know, are significant enough. Um, so a whole range of strategies um, come into play if you're looking to get onto the property ladder. Um, it's obviously if you get the advice early and make sure it's structured correctly, it's all set up exactly how it's um, intended to for the long term, it's much more cost effective to do that upfront than try and replace it later. So I suppose from my um, from my broad perspective, again, if, if property is something that you're looking to get into, speak to speak to your mortgage broker, speak to your financial advisor, speak to your lawyer about how the impacts of um, structuring property are going to be are going to work for you. Um, yeah, we'll just skip over that. <laughs> and I'll come over to my last bit of um, the the thing here. We're seeing lots of lots of news, lots of um, 
lots of highlights around where the market has performed, where where do we see it next, where, where, where is the place to invest. You can see here that we're seeing a lot of green on this graph, all but except Russia. So um, Russia and parts of China and Asia, um, where we've got um, some reds there. And that is obviously reflective of the current political and economic conditions in those, in those countries and jurisdictions. But broadly around the world, we've seen healthy gains, particularly over the last, um, over the last, you know, 12 months per se, up until April 2024. So, you know, if you've got investments, you know, generally in the green zones, you should have, you should likely have pretty good, like a, a nice healthy sort of style of return, which has been um, wonderful, particularly in, in Aussie equities and US equities, where those most markets are up circa beyond 8%. Where I see opportunities. So this is where we start to see value, um, the value heat map um, amongst the world. So this is areas where we start to see undervalued equ equities versus overvalued equities. Aussie um, equities, again, with a softening Aussie dollar, we see a nice little bump up um, in the Aussie equity prices. So that has helped, which is Morningstar's research pla places, I suppose, as an industry broadly starting to hit the overvalued territory. That is not necessarily a reason to not invest in Australian equities because there are, it just depends, again, on your on your situation and what's going to be more important, particularly going forward. For example, in this, we don't want to be rushing in to be buying only Russian equities in this because they're undervalued. Well, that doesn't mean that you're going to yield a good outcome. So really, really good um there's plenty of opportunity in the market still to come. Um, it just depends on your own personal circumstance and what you're aiming to achieve to get out of it. Um, a low Aussie dollar, again, for our for our non-resident um, visitors into the, into the webinar, you know, if there's a time to take advantage of AUD weakness, it's probably now. This is obviously, I've got lots of clients that live in Singapore. The Sing dollar to the Aussie dollar, you know, it's been bobbling around, you know, a dollar ten to dollar fifteen for a, for a while now, and so this is obviously a good opportunity for strategies that if you are earning in foreign currencies and you are looking to come um, or invest, repatriate, or start to plan retirement income objectives in Australia, you know, it's a good time to be considering your Aussie dollar exposure here and your investments in Aussie dollars, because if that's going to be your domicile currency in the long run, then there's obviously advantages there particularly. Not so much of an advantage when, you know, we travel to, us Australians travel to Singapore and look to pay for chicken and rice and it costs 15% more. But, you know, broadly speaking, the other way around, it's a good opportunity. Um, I don't know, Joel, that uh, chicken rice is still cheaper than it would be back in Australia, to be fair, yeah. even with a 15% <laughs> surcharge. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. Um, <laughs> And again, investment 101, right, we've got to play the long game. So we've got to make sure that, you know, we're not trying to time the market here. It's time in the market that's going to give us um, our long-term returns, our long-term performance. Um, so you can see here, this was um, Vanguard Post, a wonderful um, graph every year, and it's the, the return index chart, and this is highlighting up until the end of 2023, um, and it's the growth of $10,000 if you were invested in both asset classes and you did nothing basically since then. So yeah, if you had $10,000 in US equities in 1992, they would be worth $176,000 today. So it's really important to take into account to playing the long game, particularly when CPI, which is the very low bar, is sitting at 21,000. So really important to um, always play the long game when looking at our investments. That sort of concludes up my um, investment rant uh, for now. So there's always plenty, I suppose, to talk about. There's always plenty of strategies that we like to look at, particularly for um different families, different um, stages of life. You know, women very importantly should uh, understand and can take control of their financial um, independence more or less. I like to, I like to sort of quasi think of myself as part-time financial advisor, part-time educator. I have a strong passion for financial literacy. Um, and it's about 
you know, if we can understand our financial situation, then we can always benefit from it. So if you just so much want to have a chat, get in touch. You know, I'm happy to I'm happy to run through some 101s. Wonderful. Well, look, uh, thank you very much, Joel. Um, yeah, very grateful for the overview there. As as you can all tell, there is so much we could cover on these sessions. Uh, obviously, we've tried to sort of keep the focus on the estate planning side, on uh, building up women's financial literacy, building up that sort of financial empowerment, taking control of your money, knowing what's where and why it's there, making sure it's working for you. Um, but uh, certainly, look, a huge thank you to both Jane and Joel. Uh, for joining us today, for sharing your knowledge. Um, Jane, as I said at the beginning, I'm sure we probably just could have gone down that estate planning rabbit hole for the full hour and touched on nothing else. Uh, it's just such an important topic. Um, yes. Some people view it, I think, as a, a little bit morbid and maybe put it in the too hard basket or the, oh, we'll get to that later. All the or, time. You know, all I don't the have time. family, yes. so I don't care. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. those terrible things which should absolutely not be done. So um, what we will do, we will uh, pop both Joel and Jane's contact details in the notes uh, so you'll uh, be able to reach out to both. Any questions, uh, case studies, obviously you want to look after your own finances and estate planning, please do reach out to them. Uh, we're going to wrap up there. I'm mindful of everyone's time. We've run a little bit over. Uh, but a huge thank you for everyone who's uh, remained with us on the webinar. Thank you again to Jane and Joel and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.